So uh, welcome here, everybody. Uh, my name is David Johnson. I'm the new chair of the Libertarian Party of King County as of last Saturday. Uh, we had an awesome convention for you guys. Yeah, yeah, good to see some faces here that were there. Uh, Brendan's outside there. He was also a... Uh, Featured prominently in the convention, often. Uh, in case you couldn't tell, with my opening talk being how to be a political ninja, I'm a little bit of a nerd. Uh, so bear with me in terms of, uh, of being a little bit, uh, I'm a data-driven guy. I'm a guy who likes to, to make kind of analogies to get people to understand the concepts a little bit better. And we're going to have a little bit of fun with it in terms of... Uh, I'm trying to draw some parallels. I, I will forewarn you, all of all that I know about ninjas, I learned from Wikipedia while making notes on this. Uh, so everything here will be 100% true because it all comes from Wikipedia. Uh, so uh, the general focus of this talk is to talk about how to be, uh, be somebody who is able to enact change in the world, uh, in the political sphere. Uh, so the question that uh, that you have to answer to figure out how to be more like a ninja is first you ask why are ninjas cool? Why do people think a ninja is cool? Um, one of the so so there are kind of three main uh, components of things that ninjas have, which is that they can take on a lot of different roles. They can uh, use a wide variety of tactics, and the difference is a role is something you are that you play out that you uh, represent yourself toward other people. A tactic is something you do you execute on. Um, and then they have gears with tools, uh, you, uh, all of the iconic ninja tools you have, like a, a sword, or you've got the, the uh, shurikens, or you've got uh, the sai, and uh, they even have utility belts like Batman. I didn't know that, but I, uh, I found out that's a thing. Uh, and they have cool things like smoke bombs. Uh, they find the tools to make stuff happen in the situation they're in. Masters uh, of invisibility. And yes, they are masters of invisibility. So that's so the fourth point is kind of what they do, uh, what which makes them cool is they strike fear into people who stand against them. So if the the coolest thing about a ninja is nobody wants to mess with a ninja because the ninja is going to have every advantage against you. You're not going to know when they're coming, and they're going to uh, they they make you hesitate to take action in that direction. Um, and sometimes, especially because we, as libertarians, are a smaller party, you have to take advantage of the factor that you're not going to stand uh, uh, shoulder by shoulder and march an army straight at the other guys, you know, British versus American Revolution style. Uh, you're not going to march the armies together. You've got to be the, the guerrilla warfare. And that's what the ninja kind of embodied uh, culturally, was they were this X factor that, that influenced the politics of their time and uh, influence the power structures of their time while just being a single person. So what makes, what makes a ninja scary? Why do people worry if a ninja's coming off after them but not a puppy? Um, so, uh, puppies can bite. I mean, they can be, they can be pretty bad. Um, a ninja is self-sustained, and I think that's probably one of the most valuable things you can learn politically um, in growing yourself is understanding how do I be a person who's not going to let things get in my way and is going to be able to move forward on things um, even when they get tough. So you don't you don't think, oh, a ninja's gonna run into a wall and think, oh, I'm gonna go back home. You know, this is too hard. They're not going to, to see a, a couple guards outside the house and think, oh, well, you know, I didn't really need to knock that guy off. Um, they know how to, to take the problem and they're not gonna go have to go ask somebody for help. They're gonna go figure out how to do it on their own. So being self-sustained makes it very hard to, to stop some uh, ninja who's going after you. Um, the other thing is they're very disciplined. So they're very focused on the task at hand, and they see it through to the end. Um, it, they aren't easily distracted. A ninja doesn't go on his way to go assassinate someone and then you know see a good post, post on Facebook and jump over and start arguing on that. Um, they're focused on, you know, I've got this job in front of me, I've got this task, I'm going to execute to it. I'm going to get through whatever inclement conditions. It doesn't matter if it's cold, it's hot, it's rainy. Uh, the, the ninja doesn't complain and worry about putting up an umbrella. You know, if they have to wait in the rain, they endure hardship. Um, they're pragmatic. When The way the ninja would spend their time is they would spend their time on kind of one of two things. Either you're building up the skills to execute on something or you're executing on that. 
So you're either training or you're actually doing. Uh, so by being focused on that, they were able to become specialists in the areas that where they would be able to make the most impact, where they would be able to bring unique value. Um, and finally, they're surprising. Uh, the ninja, as, as Terry mentioned, comes from the shadows. They, you don't know where they're going to come from. You don't know what tactics they're going to use. Um, so a lot of the value is that they are able to, uh, to come at people and situations in ways that somebody who's just a normal social person would not be able to. And they don't let their targets get comfortable, which is what makes it scary. Um, when, when somebody tries to, you know, do a normal guard routine walking around and time everything, you know, they're going to take advantage of that routine. They're going to, to observe things and disrupt people who are, who are in patterns or, in, or trying to kind of do the same thing over and over again. So things you don't see a ninja do. They don't sit around saying someone should. I think this is, um, this is like one of my personal political pet peeves, is, um, and it's also true outside of politics, is when people go to somebody in leadership and they have a long list of things. They say, we should do, we should do, we should do, we should do. Granted, there are some people who legitimately can't do some of the things. I love, um, shout out to Mr. Michael Wilson, who was watching, who wanted to see the recording of this anyhow. Um, he, he says, he uh, gives a lot of great advice on things we should do and he has served the party for a very long time um, and is at the point where he can't do a lot of uh, things, but Excuse I see me. most of the people. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Is number 19 in here? Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't see a tag. I'm so sorry. I apologize for interrupting. I see a... Uh, Thank you. Uh, I see a lot of people um, in this room, and it's not typical of other parties who are young, who don't have gray hair. Like you go to any other meetup for any of the other parties, everybody's everybody's got gray hair. I made that joke at the Liberty at uh, the Liberty Rock Seattle event, and uh, and poor Joey took offense because he was the only gray hair guy in the room. <laughs> He's like, not all of us are not gray, um, but it, but it made the point. Um, we're all young, for the most part. Um, we can get things done. Uh, there's no reason why we have to assume somebody else should do everything. I wouldn't be chair here if it were not the case that you can just step up and you can go from saying somebody should to doing it yourself or finding somebody who will, who will work with you to go at it. Um, you don't see a ninja just getting angry and lashing out at people, especially their allies. Another thing that, that can be sometimes hard, especially in politics, uh, we all come into this because we're passionate about how things, about ideology, about, um, about how the world should be, about the injustices here. And sometimes when people have differences on that, it's really easy to get caught up into, well, you know, we're gonna sit here and argue about the nuance of that, how we're going to, uh, you know, who's, who doesn't belong here anymore and stuff. Um, you don't see ninjas, ninjas do that sort of thing. Um, they, they, take care of, they take care of business, they understand that there are things that need to be done and you work with the people you need to for that. Taking into account, if they're trying to sabotage or trip, trip you up, you might need to punch them in the face if that was the case. But otherwise, you know, you understand who your friends are, who your enemies are, and you take care of stuff in accordance with that. Um, blaming others when, when something goes wrong, that's another thing. Um, the, the reason why sometimes it can be easy for the existing, one of the reasons it can be easy for existing political parties to kind of uh, keep up their momentum is the more that you win, the less that you have any sort of internal disagreement, right? If, if your party wins, then everybody's like, well, we did everything right, cool. You won 50.1% 50, 50 of the vote, cool. We did everything perfect, our party has no problems, we're winning elections, uh, congratulations everybody, go out, have a drink, pat on the back. If you lose with 49.9% of the vote, you did everything wrong. There's somebody in the party that's dragging you down. They're terrible people. They're, they're, they're just out to, to sabotage you. They're, maybe they're helping the other side win. Or maybe it's even those libertarians over there who split the vote. But <laughs> um, The point is, um, it's powerful to accept ownership for what you do and for uh, the results that come out of that. Because when you accept ownership for the results of things, for the results of your activities, then you accept that you own the power to go and change them. Uh, if you don't accept ownership and you blame other people, then you're just going to spend all your time lashing out at other people. Um, 
they don't restrict themselves to their comfort zone. Um, this is an easy one in politics. There's lots of people, myself included, I never pictured I would, uh, I would ever see myself out knocking on the stranger's door and talking to them about politics uh, or, or calling up their phone. Uh, but it's not, once you get out of your comfort zone, it's actually not crazy. The world isn't going to end if you knock a stranger's door and something awkward happens and you move on. Uh, you have to challenge your comfort zone to be effective, whether it's in politics or business or anywhere. Um, you have to, to sit down with yourself and understand what the, what the consequences of not getting outside of your comfort zone are and the rewards of getting it outside of your comfort zone and uh, challenging yourself. And that's really uh, one of the ways you grow as a person because once, once you do that once, it helps build that confidence that says, hey, the world's not going to come down if I do something risky. I can go ahead and take other steps out here to make something happen. And, and it really opens up the world to you. Um, a lot of times, as a, as a smaller party, libertarians feel kind of trapped, like we don't have an apparatus to deal with. Um, the political world is a small world, and there's a, you'd be surprised at how few people do the lifting, even in the major parties. Um, it just takes one person who says to themselves, I'm going to get outside of my comfort zone and take on some tasks that I didn't think I was uh, ever going to do and they change the world. Uh, and the other thing is um, accepting a status quo where they are at an advantage. Um, if you uh, sit around and kind of just pound at the, at the wall, you're never going to get through that wall. A ninja takes that hook, throws it on top of the wall, gets over the wall. If they can't get a clean shot at their target, they climb up to somewhere where they're going to be able to. You, you have to not only um, not only take a straight shot at your destination, but you have to understand the course that puts you in a position to be in an advantage, to be, to to take that shot, to to gain that information, to uh, to do what you need to do, um, and you need to move toward once you've got an advantage. You you leverage that to gain more advantages. Um, for libertarians, there are tons of issues where we have an advantage on, and they, we can use that to gain advantages on other issues. Uh, so, as I said, Wikipedia is my source for everything about ninjas for this discussion. So, according to Wikipedia, the, what, what presentation about ninjas would be complete without a definition of what a ninja is? Uh, so, according to Wikipedia, a ninja was a covert agent or mercenary in feudal Japan. The functions of the ninja include espionage, sabotage, infiltration, assassination, and guerrilla warfare. Um, kind of like American revolutionaries, probably. Uh, their covert methods of waging guerrilla warfare were deemed dishonorable and beneath the samurai who observed strict rules about honor and combat. Again, sounds very similar to American Revolution and, you know, most political insurgency. Uh, so there's a good reason to consider it a good analogy for being a libertarian or any other um, insurgent political group. Um, I, I like the reference to the samurai here. Uh, if, if you know anything about samurai, samurai were kind of very much opposite of ninjas. They um, were... Uh, subject to a lord, and they would basically stay and protect that lord. Um, they were the, the ninja was mobile and would go out and hide, and the samurai was the one who would sit there and fight honorably and guard their lord. Um, and there's nothing wrong with with uh, being somebody who protects things and and keep, takes care of things and defends things. Um, when you're a, when you're a libertarian party at single digit percentages nationally, um, it's not the time to be a samurai. You don't have a castle to protect. Um, the other guys up there in the big castle up there, and you're sitting down here in your little hut. I mean, you can guard your hut. You're not going to ever get into the castle that way, though. Um, so uh, you have to, uh, and the other temptation there is kind of building walls around that, which is, oh, you, you create more barriers to keep people out instead of creating more opportunities for you to go more places. Uh, so, so it's important to have the mindset of, we're looking to grow, not we're looking to create a space, wall it off, and define it. Um, growth can be hard, it can be challenging, um, and it's risky uh, when you're not building up walls around you. Walls are safe, they make you feel good, but uh, you've got to be willing to get outside of that if you're going to challenge the status quo and uh, take down the big guy. So we'll talk a little bit about the different roles that Ninja takes, because that was the first thing that, uh, that kind of defined what made a ninja uh, interesting. Um, so one role that ninjas did, which I never knew about, but I've never seen it on a movie, is uh, sometimes they would sneak into an enemy army 
during a huge ground warfare, and they would steal the flag uh, from their flag carrier, take down the flag carrier, take the flag. And then they grab the flag and take it a different direction. So back in those days before you had um, cell phones or headsets, um, the flag determined where the army went. So if you seize the flag, you could control your enemy's movements, at least until they figured out that you were probably not the real flag bearer, and then they try to chop you down. Um, in that case, they might still keep chasing you, so you know that works too. Uh, <laughs> so um, trust is the currency of politics. I think this is, this is a, a foundational thing to take away in general. Um, you build your position in politics by earning the trust of people, and by um, leveraging that trust to get people to, to come on board with you, to work with you. And you, you, you build that by, by working with them or giving them something they value. Um, so you want to, uh, one of the convenient things about kind of the different banners in politics is that they, they are a way to convey trust. For example, if I said freedom, you probably are inclined to, some, to say somebody uh, that stands up for freedom, to support them, to think well of them, than if I said, let's enslave people, right? You're probably going to negatively react to that. That's not the flag you want to rally under. For some people it is. Um, so so we have, there are a lot of different kind of flags in politics that represent the values people care about, the, the positions they value, the, the sort of uh, North Stars that they want to, to take things toward, um, liberty, justice, fairness, uh, compassion are kind of some, and, and you can figure out how those fit into the left, the right politically, um, people, progressives all over. Um, <laughs> each of those can kind of fit in different ways. Uh, so in order to, to be able to, to take some of that energy and move it in the direction we want it to, it helps to claim the flag on some of those issues. To claim, hey, we know what liberty is better than people who you know, want to keep gays from being married. Or we know what liberty is better than people who want to tax you out of your own home. Um, or to tell you who you can sell a cake to, or not. Um, so there's a whole bunch that are really good for libertarians. Uh, fiscal responsibility, ending the drug war, uh, marriage rights, free trade, immigration opportunity, ending foreign wars, um, just to start on the things. Uh, libertarians have a huge advantage in, in having all of these different issues that we can gain points of leverage on and rally people under. And we see it happen effectively for our candidates in, uh, in our communities here where we see a lot of people come out when they hear things about, like for example, Michelle talking about housing justice. That gets people angry when they hear that, you know, there's a company out there that's owning your state law and is taking people's homes out from under them in their old age. Um, it makes people angry when you hear about um, how people are dumping money into the homeless industrial complex in, uh, in Seattle and we're dumping millions and millions and nothing gets done and people stay on the streets who are looking for homes. Uh, it makes people mad when they hear that um, Sound Transit gets so much money that uh, you could buy everybody a Prius in the whole area. <laughs> and you, they, you won't even have anything for your money for, what, 12 years or whatever it is. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot of areas where we can look at the existing frustrations there and we don't even need to create our own. Uh, another role that you can take on that helps things is being uh, a spy. And here I use that broadly to refer to not only knowing about things going on in other parties, which is you know obvious, you can, uh, you can go and figure out what's going on, um, but also just general information gathering. Uh, information is power and it allows you to make the right decisions in politics. And a lot of people don't like to do the unsexier work of, of combing through information about voter data, about, um, about uh, what their opponent has been voting on. That information is all out there. Uh, you just have to have somebody go through it and crunch it, and it's just a matter of t somebody taking that time. And it's amazing how many things don't get caught because nobody bothers to take the time to look through it. Um, you can be that one person. Um, I, I think of, for example, uh, like Glenn Morgan, uh, has gotten very famous in the state for filing a bajillion uh, PDC filings against uh, Democrats. Uh, one person. He does, he does all of that. Um, that's that's the, the ninja spirit in this uh, uh, context here, is this idea that, hey, I can take one thing, I can get really good at this and, tri and break some ground that nobody else is breaking here, just by picking something and, and going with it. 
Um, some of the information um, also includes bills and legislative activities. There's a, in fact, there's a tool I forgot to add, I'll add later in the slide, to help with monitoring that sort of stuff um, that I've used this year, and it helps you get ahead on issues. It's really cool when you come out with something on Facebook or get to your, your audience before the press does, because then that makes you look credible in the future, because it's like, hey, we figured out this issue before it was, it was big. If you want to be on the next issue that comes in before, uh, you want to you want to be in with us, um, and also just finding out events and opportunities in the community. Um, there's a lot of events that happen in the community, and part of what we were talking about building trust, it's just having your face out there, having people know it, or just having a voice in the crowd, uh, representing liberty. Be it uh, at town halls with legislators, be it at um, parades or other other events where a political organization would be appropriate to wave some signs and stuff like that. We did like. Um, with Michelle, we went down to, um, there was a wine festival down in Kirkland. You can do that sort of thing. Um, events bring people to the community. You want to reach out to people um, who would not normally be hearing the Liberty message or engaged with it. Um, it's a numbers game, and that's, that's where you win the numbers is by getting more people. Uh, the saboteur is one of the other ones. Uh, once a ninja <coughs> understands the weakness of their target, target, they open it up to exploit it. Um, the saboteur takes the information that, the, that somebody like the spy finds. They find that, for example, a, a PDC uh, person takes money from Wash Bank Pack. Uh, and now you go and spread around that information. You, you open, open that wound up so that that, uh, that weakness is now exposed. So uh, you, you can take it out to social media. You can, um, you can take it out to the community. You can take it out uh, to political opponents, to people who might donate money to you. Um, you learn how to take, to go from information about a vulnerability to opening up that vulnerability. Um, as a citizen against a politician, you have a huge advantage. In fact, if you're not somebody like me who's sitting on a board of a party, um, it, you have unique advantages that I don't have um, in terms of having political impact because you can credibly claim, hey, I'm just a citizen of my city. You can stand up in a town hall and say, hey, I'm concerned about this thing. You can say, hey, why did you do that? That's not, against, uh, that's not in line with the values of our community. Why are you against transparency? Why are you, against, why are you giving this break to mushroom farmers? Um, <laughs> that's a real thing. It happened in the state legislature this year. One of my reps uh, sponsored that. <laughs> They're paying them a few million dollars to move to eastern Washington. It's crazy. Um, yeah, your tax money at work. Uh, as long as you, as long as you look reasonable, um, looking like the nutcase in the crowd probably won't generally help your cause. So you want to figure out what the what the values of your community are, how your politician is against them, and how you can stand up and be that bridge between people and that thing they should dislike. Um, and uh, the politician themselves, if you're not very politically visible, is also unlikely to have an idea of what you stand for or what you're doing. I've seen people um, in some of the town halls who are well known by um, their local legislators. So there's a, there's a certain amount of negative social capital that gets built up once you've uh, stood up so many times in the town hall and called out that legislator. They probably know you by name at that point. They say, oh, just talk to me on email <laughs> and, uh, and, and have you sit down. But if you're somebody they've ever seen before, they don't know what to expect from you. As far as you, they know, the words out of your mouth might be to support them, um, and they are going to be hesitant to lash out at you because you, you might have been somebody who voted for them. So it's important to, uh, you can think of it like kind of a ninja stealth sort of thing, in that when they don't know who you are, um, it gives you an advantage to be able to make that, um, to, to make that attack successfully. And finally, I didn't want to use the word assassin because um, politically that's probably not a good word to use on a slide. Um, <laughs> I, call, I, I, I went through words and I call it the finisher. Um, and because broadly it's, it's referring to the concept of taking it to the next level, right? You've exploited that, weak, you've got that weakness opened up, you found the information, somebody's opened that up, people know about that, now what happens? They run unopposed on the ballot. Okay, well, so much for that. Um, you stirred all that up and didn't change much. Um, you got to have somebody who goes and closes it out and brings a result to the table after that weakness has been opened up, exposed, and is ready to be exploited. 
So um, I, I see this role as somebody who has a goal, um, whether it's being elected, whether it is um, to help to help somebody else be elected, uh, to make a to take down a, a bill, to prop up a bill. Um, you want people who are focused on finishing off the job, on making sure that you deliver an end result. In the case of a, an assassin, it would be that body's on the floor, right? Job well done, you go home. You, it's a pretty defined ending. For us, it's all, we also have well-defined endings, right? You get 50.1% of the vote, and you won that race. Your person's now in office. Congratulations, you go home for a few years. Well, you don't go home, but <laughs> you come around the next year. But at least that person gets to, uh, gets to enjoy that advantage. Um, so not only does, uh, is success important for actually the impact it has, but it builds momentum, as, as we mentioned earlier. Um, winning attracts people and brings people together. Um, they, they will see what you're doing as more right when you win, and when you lose, people get upset at you. They think you're an idiot. Um, so it's important to, to go after tasks and follow them through because when you succeed in things, it builds your momentum that's going to help you succeed at the next thing and the next thing, even if it's small things. Uh, if, you, if your candidate has a goal of winning 20% of the vote and you hit 22%, um, <clears throat> you're going to be able to tell all your supporters that's awesome. People then who come around, they come around and run the next time around. They go to their, the people who are on the fence about donating and say, hey, we broke our goal last year by several percent from what we were doing. Our goal this year is 40%. 50%, whatever, now it's credible. So if you can break your goal once and you can uh, be held to your word, then now suddenly you can, uh, you can get people to support you for a more ambitious goal. And, uh, and the other thing to keep in mind is often um, there's volunteers who are around um, who are just waiting to get a task, right? A lot of people aren't as self-started. I encourage everybody to try to be self-started because that's the best way you can guarantee through your own actions that, uh, that things will change. Um, nobody else is going to change the world for you. If so, you're really lucky. <laughs> if, you, if you, for example, if you, if you really loved everything about Trump and he just happened to get up there and win, the, then, then congratulations, you won the lottery with that. Um, for the rest of people who have problems with that to one extent or another, um, then you probably want to get involved to, to move things in the direction that advances what you care about. Um, so when you, can, uh, when you can take things toward achieving a task and break them down into ways where you can then tell volunteers, hey, you know, I've got these little tasks to do. Uh, can you just help me do this? Can you help me make a few phone calls? Can you help me by just driving the car while I go doorbelling? Um, <coughs> can you come out and uh, just share this on Facebook, or just help me make regular Facebook posts here, or, or go research this candidate. If you can break down things into those steps and find people who will do them, if you can chain that work together, you can turn that into a success. And just being that kind of leader who breaks it down, delegates things, is, uh, is very valuable, because there's a lot of people who just won't step up and, and do that sort of thing. Um, and that brings the resources in connection with the goal, and that's where success happens. Uh, so then we'll talk about uh, tactics of ninjas. Uh, so we talked about kind of different roles, which is kind of the, the, the way you frame yourself and what you're doing. Um, this is some of the specific tactics that you can employ in the course of that. Um, they're helpful. Uh, one of the things they would do is start fires. Um, people get curious why there's a fire somewhere and start um, either running toward it or running away from it, depending on the context. Um, uh, and uh, as everybody knows, there are lots of dumpsters out there that get lit on fire very often, frequently in politics, uh, for better or worse. So you can uh, you can start a fire by attracting attention to a a uh, issue that we're strong on by fanning the flames uh, locally. This can be through strong rhetoric. Taxation is theft. Um, that brings attention to people who are sick of taxes. Um, and guess what? P people thinking taxation is theft is crazy or not doesn't depend on whether they're libertarian or not. It depends how bad the taxes are. <laughs> when, when you get taxes start to break up into the 50% range for people, they're like, well, yeah, this is pretty much stealing from me. If you got only 10% taxes they're seeing they're paying and they don't think it's so bad, they're like, what? You're crazy. I, I like my roads. <laughs> uh, so you find the strong issues and you fan the flames on them. You find if you can use that fuel that is there 
uh, if you've got current events that are going on, uh, especially in the media, you can, fan, you can use that as fuel to, to bring people to you. Uh, for example, in this year we had a Bitcoin event. Uh, we got one of our largest showings up of new people there because Bitcoin was hot then, or not, depending on the day of the week. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so, that, so that brought out a lot of people who were really interested in that. And by, um, by finding the right timing on what, is, on what is on people's minds, you find a way to, to bring their attention to yourself as, as being uh, part of that. Um, it can not only be nationally in the news, it can just be in your community. Um, there could be things about a new construction development in your community that people are pissed about something or other on it. Or the fact that the, the construction won't happen because some people, you know, really wanted to keep their, you know, the place where their dog goes to crap all the time and didn't want to build them all there. Uh, so look for chances to make a spark and have others fan it for you. The ideal scenario, if you want to be the best political ninja ever, what you do is you find a place where people are real, already kind of really angry or rassled about something but not really talking about it, you just go and just drop something and say, oh, this is what just happened yesterday. And you watch people explode. You watch people that you, you don't even have to do any work at that point. You just let the community speak for you. You let the community sound crazy. They're going so far off on hating this thing, right? On, on whether it's taxes or tolls or, or whatever. If you can find that right issue and drop a spark into there, you can multiply your efforts. Um, you can, if you're going to be a Facebook warrior, that's the effective way to do it, right? You don't. The worst way to be a Facebook warrior is to sit there and writing long threads and constantly responding to somebody because one, you're not changing anybody's mind at that point. Um, two, you look like somebody who's not changing anybody's mind to everybody else. And three, it's wasting a lot of your own time that you could be better spent doing any of the other activities that, that I mentioned there to actually have an impact. Uh, so another thing is hiding and ambushing. This is, uh, this is one of the signature ninja things. Um, you want to, uh, so ninjas find the place they can be effective from, whether it's up in a tree, uh, behind, around the corner, up in a window, whatever. You find a place where you know that you are going to be able to, to, to achieve whatever goal you're trying to do, to, to shoot that arrow, to, to jump that guy, to what, whatever. And they blend in there, and they wait, and are patient. Um, this is one of the hardest things for, for libertarians is because everybody wants to get everything done now and if we didn't win this election today or whatever then the whole party is messed up and blah blah blah. Uh, news flash to everybody in politics, winning in politics takes time. <laughs> it takes time, it takes resources, and it takes uh, that long arc where you have to be consistent about what you're doing. Um, that means understanding uh, uh, where you can be and planning ahead of time. Um, we talked to like uh, uh, Toby Nixon, who's been in politics for decades at this point, um, and he spoke at our first convention last year about how you you have to build up uh, this these relationships. It's not just all about winning things with the message of liberty. It's you have to understand that in politics you are ultimately going to be serving the people, right? If you're a decent politician, if you're going to be a tyrant, you, this is probably the wrong party for you. Sorry. Uh, if you're looking to unilaterally, unilaterally push your, your whims on everybody else. Uh, otherwise, if you're, if you're seeking any office or supporting somebody for office, you're looking for somebody who's going to uh, support things that are in the best interest of the people in terms of liberty, in terms of freedom, in terms of creating more choices for people. Um, so in order to, to, to get connected to the people that you're going to be serving, you gotta go go out and meet the people. Um, you gotta go attend events, uh, join groups. It can be anything from uh, volunteering to help the homeless, um, to 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 find shelter who are who are out there and freezing on a on a you know when it drops below freezing out there. It can be um, uh, helping clean up a park. It can be whatever. Um, community service looks good in general, and <laughs> I know it's not popular. It's not sexy. But you meet people through that. You meet other people who are willing to serve. And guess what? People who are willing to serve uh, to, to help others are probably going to be willing to help you when it comes time to run a campaign, when it comes time to go with a cause. Um, so you've got to meet people, and you've got to gain their trust that, they're, that you're a good person. Uh, it sounds kind of sinister. I don't like using this with the ninja analogy so much, because it's like it sounds sinister that you're trying to, to, to blend in. It's like you're nefarious. You have this evil liberty 
ambush plan going all along, but really, um, it's just an analogy. So don't don't read anything into that if anybody on the internet finds this video ten years later. <laughs> No. Uh, so, when you engage with other people, understand what you're looking to get out of that engagement. Uh, it's it's really easy to kind of get into a thing where, and and this happens with with libertarians, even myself sometimes, where you treat libertarianism as a social event. You go there, you talk to people, you get your you get your liberty, your hit of liberty placebo out, and you go back home and sign up for the next one to come, uh, so you can go and and rant again at people. Um, that. You know, that's great psychologically, I guess. It helps you out. Um, it's not going to help much as far as liberty in general goes. Uh, you want to be purposeful when you're engaging. You're going to understand what you're trying to achieve in engagements. And you don't have to be, you know, this doesn't have to be your philosophy of life. But to be effective, um, it, this applies to Facebook arguments. This applies to, um, to meetups. This applies to any, any activity you're doing. You want to... To understand what is your goal if you're trying to move liberty forward, um, how are you how are you doing that in that situation, and how can you improve in doing that? Um, you want to be discreet with what you share and how. You want to know what the image you want other people to have of you is, um, and and that's not to say be deceptive. Understand yourself. Um, this is this is something that I talk to Michelle all the time about because Michelle loves to post things. Uh, love you, Michelle. Uh, loves to post tons of things all over Facebook. Um, she never posts almost anything personal on her Facebook. I told her, Michelle, you know, do you love spending time out with, with Jeff, going out to restaurants and stuff? Well, yeah, I love that. Do you like volunteering and stuff? Well, yeah, I do that all the time. So why do you only post political stuff on your page? He's like, well, I'm being honest. And I'm like, well, you know, being honest would include those part of your life. It would be, you, to be authentic, you have to understand who you are and understand how people are seeing you and align those up. Uh, so I told her, hey, go and post some more personal stuff. Go and humanize yourself. Show yourself out in the community of Kirkland that you're deciding to serve. Take some pictures with people. Um, so those are, those are simple practical things and it's kind of, it seems obvious, duh, when you think about it, but it's, it's against your own nature. You have to really reflect to understand how am I coming across to people and how do I want to come across. And uh, and a lot of people can kind of take the take away that to mean water down your message, be a people pleaser. No, you don't have to do that. Just understand who you are and what you and what you want people to be. There will be people out there who what they are is I preach taxation is theft all the time to everybody, and that's my message. And I'm going to put that up on a cardboard sign and on the street, and I'm going to and I'm going to start conversations that way. Awesome! All the power to you if that is if that is your gig. If you then try to run for office as a credible community servant uh, after doing that, um, that's probably going to be in contrast because people see you as one thing, as what you've already presented yourself. And then now they, they see, well, this person, you know, they, they start interesting conversations. Can they manage a budget? I'm not sure. Um, and on the other hand, you know, if you're, if you're looking to, for, to run for office, you might focus on presenting your credibility on the issues that people care about in your community. Um, I, using Michelle as an example again, she talks about housing stuff. She talks about the housing crisis and what's going on in the community with the housing problem. As somebody who is, uh, uh, practices law in that area, she has credibility and she uses that to say, hey, I can talk about this issue. I can lead on this issue. If you care about this issue, you can vote for me. I got the resume for it. And so when you present that image, that makes it much more likely that people are going to put confidence in you. Um, and finally, as you're building things out um, in, in relationships that are maybe not political, um, look for opportunities to, again, I used the, the, the ninja analogy is not what you really want to use in this, but look for ambushes, right? You look for opportunities for, hey, I'm in this position where, where I have the trust of of this person where they're interested in hearing what I have to say because I've been working with them because we have a common cause and say oh yeah about this thing man we could really use some more liberty there and they and and if you have built up trust with them even if they didn't think that already they're gonna be like huh. if you were a random stranger who walked up to them who said you know hey yeah screw that abolish the the feds <clears throat> um, <laughs> they're gonna be like okay goodbye <laughs> But if you're somebody who, who has had a relationship for, with them for a year who they think is smart on other issues and you say, yeah, the Fed really sucks, they'll say, 
Well, what do you think they'll say? They'll say, why? Right? They'll, they'll ask you, so what's the Fed? Why is there something wrong with it? Um, and that's where you start explaining things like that. That's, that's where you kind of break through and start making, uh, and start winning hearts and minds and that sort of thing. Uh, and the other thing is uh, kind of closely related is concealed movement. Um, so on one hand, it being in a position to, uh, to take action is good and kind of investing. On the other hand, you want to be able to, to move around between things. Um, a lot of times, uh, and this kind of speaks to the waving the sign sort of thing, um, libertarians kind of don't, don't think about the fact that maybe tomorrow they'll be doing something different than they're doing today. Um, and that maybe the, what they do today will have consequences on their ability to impact what they do tomorrow. Um, be discreet, understand when you, who you're talking to, um, understand uh, what, the, how they will understand you, and make the impression that you want to instead of making the impression that you would be making on yourself if you said those same words, if that makes sense. Uh, so for example, if libertarians talk about open borders, for some people, as soon as you say that word, shuts down the whole conversation. Um, you're not gonna either e either one. They're gonna they're gonna say, oh yeah, open borders, nod 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 nod, and they're not gonna listen to the rest of what you say necessarily because they're like, yeah, I already agree on that. Or they're gonna be somebody who's like, you know what? You're just you're just asking to have a Muslim army walk across the border and destroy us all. Um, that's that's what libertarians are here. <laughs> when they when they hear that phrase, um, so you got you want to know your audience and how they're going to hear the, the words that you say. Again, this is a super obvious communication thing, but it's something easy if you don't reflect on it to to not get right and to not realize why you're having trouble being affected with other people. If you are saying something and the way you hear it to yourself sounds reasonable and rational and fair and balanced between things in a not Fox News style way. Uh, but they are not hearing it that way. Uh, and so again, not, not about being dishonest or deceptive, just understanding the language you need to use to talk in the language of the person you're talking to so they actually understand your point. Um, speak, uh, yeah, and it also, it saves you a lot of time, right? So if you, if you say something that lands really hard with a preconception somebody has and that's negative, um, not only are you likely to screw over that conversation, but it, it wastes your time. Because then you have to spend you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes just explaining, hey, no, that's not actually what I meant with, about that. That's not actually my vision for this. Um, I've thought through this issue. I'm not an idiot who's t putting out a talking point. <laughs> um, uh, but, but then you have to invest the time in kind of paying back that capital that you, that you burned with that decision. Um, and also uh, keep in mind, how the point you're at in a relationship with that person. Um, if you're early on in a relationship with somebody, they're going to jump to judgments a lot quicker about stuff about you, and those judgments are going to jump either very positive or very negative. Um, so you want to, um, to understand the ways to move that positive early on so you gain the capital so you can afford to take small negative hits later. People usually, it's, it's a human brain thing, once they formed a judgment about you, it becomes very hard to correct that judgment mentally. People don't like to be proven wrong um, about people, about facts, or anything. Uh, and so when you uh, position yourself early on to be understood correctly and to be have some level of favor with them, they're more likely to keep that onward. Even when you say things that they disagree with, they're likely to, to not question their favorable impression they had of you. Uh, so now the final set of things that are uh, that are kind of the iconic things about ninjas is the tools, the cool stuff. Uh, one of the most iconic ninja things is a uh, grappling hook. They used to climb a wall. Uh, the, for ninjas, the scariest thing is you can't build a wall high enough or thick enough to keep a ninja out of somewhere. Um, and so uh, learning how to, to get through the, uh, the walls in politics is, is a lot of the work we can do. Um, because we're a small party, and there are two major parties that have been up there controlling things for a long time, uh, those two parties have put up a lot of walls. Um, they, it is in your advantage when you are ruling to build up the walls to keep you ruling, and they have spent decades on that sort of thing. Um, we have to understand that even if they spent five years building up a wall, that there are ways you can get around it. Sometimes you just gotta bust through it, 
but you got to look for the tools to help you uh, to get past that to really get to what you need to do. Um, for example, on media access, it's a lot harder for libertarians to get media coverage. Uh, one thing you can do that we've done in Kirkland this year uh, a whole bunch of times, just write letters to the editor with a viewpoint that's interesting that will make people uh, read an article that, that's in some way novel or interesting. You'll get published, uh, whether it's the Seattle Times, whether it's uh, in the local reporters, um, whatever. You'd be surprised. You just write a few letters, and I think probably when I've written them, probably 50% of the time at least, they end up getting published. Free media. It sits up there in the news feeds right next to the major articles in the print things. You didn't pay a dime for it. And you're paying to be in a paper. That's like that's thousands of dollars. So congratulations. You just managed to contribute you know, hundreds of dollars worth of value to the libertarian cause by sitting there and writing that instead of a Facebook post. <laughs> um, if you're outfunded, this is a crazy one for libertarians. If you ever look at the PDC filings, it is insane how much money some of these politicians get. What's even more insane is where they get it from. Um, it's, it's usually not from people like you and I. It's usually from a lot of PACs. It's usually from a lot of... Uh, of businesses, um, usually not the small kinds. Uh, so, you know, you're not going to go overnight and suddenly get lots of funds. Um, the truth of politics is that the way that people generally invest funds, um, by people I mean businesses or other parties that have political interests, most of them aren't partisan. Um, most of them bet on the winner because they want to find the person who's most probably going to win make sure they've got the thousand dollars in their pocket or whatever, so when time comes around they say, hey, I was a donor to you. Maybe you could help me out a little bit here. I'll donate to you again. Um, so, it's, so it can be hard for libertarians because we don't have that record of winning, again going back to wins create wins, um, to convince people that, hey, uh, if you're going to invest in a politician that's going to write the policies for you, it might be a libertarian. Um, one of the things you can do is highlight that uh, when we're talking about the candidates that we're running against, um, the incumbents. So uh, in a lot of times, uh, it's, it's crazy. Some of the organizations that politicians take money from on both sides of the aisle, and really, there's not a whole ton of difference. Uh, if you look at the filings, uh, you see people who are voting for net neutrality, taking money from AT&T and Comcast. You see people who are voting for bank regulations or against them, taking money from the bank pack. You see people who, um, uni unions is its whole own topic in politics in terms of money. Um, I just, it's, it's funny, I, I did research for a few candidates on their opponents, and you look at the PDC pilots as part of that, and I just stopped even listing off unions there, because like, no matter whether you're Republican, Democrat, whatever, the, the SEIU, uh, which you might have heard of recently, um, got a whole bunch of stuff passed to keep medical workers in the state um, bound up to them. Uh, they're just like a given on there. You might as well be like the free bingo square on, on PDC filings. It's just always there at the top, <laughs> uh, especially for Democrat candidates. Um, so by recognizing that, you can then talk about that to voters, because nobody likes the idea of thinking their politician was bought off. Um, and if you have that information and the ability to message it, it can, it can be a conversation starter. It gives you leverage where you take that money that they earned and turn it against them. Um, so if, you, if there's something you don't know how to do, if, if it's just a wall in your way, um, don't know, you know how to get a graphics logo design, don't know how to launch a website, um, don't know how to write a good phone script, whatever. Um, there's a lot of sources out there, but notwithstanding Ask us. Any, anybody in the county party will gladly help out with, with things like that. We've, uh, we've worked through campaigns. We've, we've gotten over a lot of these walls before. Um, there's also communities out there like the Open Source Liberty Community, um, which I know Michelle leveraged quite a bit. Um, we found some awesome people through there uh, that are people like you or me who just said, hey, you know, I don't have a libertarian candidate in my district or whatever, I look, but I really want to move things forward. I'm just going to go put my name in the hat here and say, hey, I'm going to go help somebody in another state or whatever. And they're waiting for you to come along and say, hey, I can use your skills. I can use your help. Uh, so, so taking advantage of, of those sort of things 
is, uh, is a great way not only to, to help advance the things you're trying to advance and are passionate about, but it also hooks up somebody else so they can now uh, be having more success. Uh, weapons, so this is where I start getting specific. So I'm going to publish this all online because I have the, the links for all this stuff. Um, this is just some of the, the things that uh, we've learned over the past few years. Um, I've started up uh, uh, a, it's a WordPress blog, but it, I try to pull it a, an archive that just archives a whole bunch of articles for candidates. Um, it's, it's, my dumb, I, it's my dumb thing that I do when I'm tired at night and I just go through my feeds and start putting stuff and categorizing it there. Uh, it's called LPWA Policy Info. I would love to have people contributing because it's stupid easy to contribute. You just find an interesting link, you, you post it in there, you archive it, and then you put some tags on it. And the goal is that when a candidate comes along, and for example, they have an opponent who's talking about labor unions a lot, they can jump on that blog and there's a category for unions, <coughs> and they can click on that. And here's a whole bunch of articles that now they can start looking about what's going on with unions in the state. Oh, there's a Supreme Court ruling coming up on this. Oh, this is, uh, here's an example of where something went, uh, unions were abusing something here. Um, here's an example where unions did good by being more libertarian about how they approach things. And here's an example of how public unions were screwing over the taxpayers here. Uh, so, so by doing that, you can have candidates step up and, and have issues they didn't know anything about and, uh, and suddenly overnight, they're, they're an expert and are able to say, oh yeah, you didn't see what happened that last week to the other person there? And now they look like the more educated person on that issue. <laughs> uh, so for managing contacts and phone banking and other things, we have an awesome guy who's actually, I, I just talked to him this morning, his name is uh, Michael Sweeney. Uh, shout out, uh, he's with the Libertarian Party of Ohio. And he has a tool called Contacts Helper that is an awesome uh, CRM tool, which is a customer relations management. Basically means keeps your contacts in one place online. You can keep track of your interactions with them, all of their contact information. Um, you can keep track of what they are. For all the people who signed up here, part of why I do the sign-in sheet is so I can keep track of, of who has come to what event. So I can say, hey, oh, I remember you when I talk, if I call you on the phone for an event, I can say, oh yeah, I remember meeting you at this event because we have like hundreds, thousands of contacts. I'm not going to remember everybody, but if I see, oh, that person was at the Liberty Talks event for March, I'd be like, oh, that was Jake. I remember, I remember his face. <laughs> uh, not, and, and I'm probably one of the more terrible people with faces and names anyhow. So that's, uh, that's always helpful to kind of have those tools to help out with that sort of stuff. Um, it also has some automatic phone banking stuff. Um, Dylan, thanks for helping with some of that stuff. You've seen it. It's pretty easy to use, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, and so if you're uh, involved with the National Party newsletter and stuff, you might have seen the Nationals building a CRM solution as well, because they recognize that this is a huge gap and a huge advantage that main parties have uh, by having this. Um, and he said, uh, to quote him, he said he is light years ahead of them right now. So I like that. Um, he's also super responsive. Um, if you're trying to organize your team, um, we have software called Basecamp that we use. Um, it's a great uh, kind of, it's got Slack-like features, it's got uh, to-do lists, tasks, and stuff like that, which really helps to get a team <coughs> organized, um, to delegate things between people. Um, and we, uh, we offer that to um, candidates or people who are looking to use that with approval. Um, MailChimp, Wix, these are common, just general tools that are used uh, in the world out there for marketing, for email contact, uh, web pages, things like that. Uh, ninjas probably have a map. If you're going to somewhere unusual, you probably want to know what you're doing when you get there. I mean, ninja instincts are a certain thing, but at some point you kind of need to, to know the layout of the place if you're going to be really effective at, at infiltrating. Um, so there's the, there's the literal maps you can get, great link there to go understand your districts. I'm still not terribly super on remembering every single district in King County because there's a lot of them, um, but I've started to learn them and if you're a visual learner, looking at a map can help. Um, also if you're, if you're a candidate or working with a candidate, you can figure out where different precincts are. Uh, you can look up your own officials in your district. Um, there's a tool there, it's, uh, you might have seen it if you've um, 
if you've worked with much stuff uh, with politics stuff here, um, you can look up who your representatives are, what district you're in. All you do is plug in, and and this is something you can give to people who are asking you questions online. Like a common question is from people are like, "Am I in this person's district?" Um, it's simple to look up. You just send them to that tool, and you say, "Oh yeah, I'll have that candidate on my ballot. Cool. Tell me more about them." Uh, simple stuff. There is a uh, massive voter registration database, which if you've never seen this, is one of the creepiest things that nobody, nobody knows is actually exists. Um, if you are registered to vote in King County, then your birth date, your address, and uh, your first last name, and all that good stuff are all up on a nice giant database. Uh, so if you ever are curious about where anybody lives, I would not advocate for using it for this, but you, know, you, can, you can look up where anybody lives who's registered to vote. Through this, and it's helpful um, for the aforementioned reason. If you get somebody who who comes in and says, "Am I in your district?" So this was interesting, like in Michelle's campaign, um, where Kirkland has like three legislative districts that are all it's part of, and so you'd have people come in and like, "Well, are they going to be in my ballot?" Okay, I look up your name. I see. Okay, you're in this district. Um, so it's super useful. It also helps to uh, you can look up demographics there by age on precincts, so you can get an idea of. What the, what the age composition is of your area. Um, you can look at addresses, and this kind of integrates into um, something on the next slide, or is it this one? Um, about voter science as well, um, where they pull in that data. So it's super, it's super helpful to, um, to be able to just have, have that data. All the, you know, all the major parties are using this data and know, every, know enough about you and are building up profiles on you that are way worse than us. <laughs> Um, if, you're, if you're thinking of running for office, um, there are basically only two web pages you really need to look at for the most part to, to get yourself in the door, which is uh, King County has a nice candidate guide which walks you through the whole process, pretty nice. And uh, they've got, uh, the PDC has a separate page which tells you how to file and you just fill out a couple forms, you're good to go. That's the hard part of the paperwork. That's what everybody finds intimidating is, oh, what paperwork do I have to fill out? Is this complicated? Am I going to get sued? Will they haul me off to prison if I don't get my C110-9000 filled out? Uh, no, it's like just a couple forms and uh, you can just go to the web page and if you, can, uh, if you can figure out how to file your taxes, this is like 10 times easier than filing your, your taxes normally. Uh, if you can go through a tax filing program, this is probably easier than that. Uh, also, um, a tip for candidates, I, I forgot to mention this to one candidate, but it's um, if you ever meet, run into somebody who's considering running for office, um, always make sure that you say you are considering running for office until you are, uh, you are actually ready to file and get your paperwork in. Um, just the state law that says you have to, within two weeks, file your C1 form. If you said, I'm going to run for office. Um, so, it's just spread that wisdom out there to people. You don't want people to go say I'm running for office and then they don't file their paperwork. It looks bad. Um, bigger problem for major party people, but you know we want to we want to comply with the law. Um, and I've also personally, uh, speaking of some of the voter registration stuff, and and uh, I've compiled a lot of um, data about election results um, that can analyze things, look through uh, look through the results, see patterns, uh, precinct by precinct. This has helped out candidates a lot. Um, if you have another cause where you're doing um, anything at the, anything to reach out to the community um, and you need information, I can help you with that. Uh, got my email there. Uh, that is kind of on a one-off basis at this point where I help people, but it's been super helpful. Like you can produce heat maps that look at um, where are the areas in the district that lean anti-tax, where are the ones that lean anti-money in politics, just by looking at how people voted on past elections, and of course, partisan uh, affiliation as well. So, the final, the final point, which, uh, which I'm glad you guys are here for me with, is the ninjas train with ninjas. Uh, events like this one are great to get together and share information and ideas like this to understand what's going on around the county. Uh, to understand that new secret you found to climbing a wall, or to to take down the take down the guys with that particular style of armor, or whatever. Um, ninja ninjas share their secrets and train together and uh, and build up. Um, I'd encourage you strongly find candidates to volunteer for. Um, it's the best way to get into the game because no candidate is ever going to say no. I hate having a volunteer come and help me. Um, every candidates want to bring you in, and almost any campaign. 
the more you are willing to do, the more they will let you do. Um, and they'll mentor you in the process because everybody's happy to have a volunteer who's willing to do more than somebody who says they'll do something and doesn't show up for it. That's the worst kind of volunteer. Um, <laughs> and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of people in politics, but if you're trying to go beyond, um, you will have, go to the stars. Because uh, there's always more work to do, especially in a small party. Um, just if you're looking for um, for things to kind of grow in your spare time, uh, I would encourage. There's several good liberty podcasts. Uh, in particular, I recommend the Leading Liberty podcast with Jim Gray. That is a really good practical one where she interviews a lot of people who are in campaigning, who are in outreach, who are in um, building organizations. Very practical talks to them about practical tips on everything from how to advertise on social media, how to fundraise, how to um, message as a candidate. Um, awesome stuff that even if you don't do it yourself, you can, you can tell other people like, hey, you know, I heard from this credible person here that this is a good way to, to do this. Uh, again, it's sharing knowledge, training each other. Um, in general, tips as somebody who's been, who's been around for a few years, um, pace yourself. In politics, um, this is a long game. There's not one year where you're going to come along and suddenly Liberty Bells will ring all across and the state turns gold. Um, I would never, you never go into a campaign saying, I'm going to lose and telling all your volunteers, I'm going to lose. Um, that doesn't change the reality that the fact is you probably, as a libertarian, there's a high likelihood of losing, especially if it's your first time running. Um, so don't let that get you down. And uh, remember, what the biggest thing I would emphasize is find the things that energize you, and this is a good professional thing in general. Um, find the things that energize you about volunteering, whether it's you just love talking to people, you love sharing things on social media, you love crunching numbers. I'm a nerd. I, I, I like going through numbers. It's yeah, it's something that just gives me energy. Uh, I can sit up late at night doing that, and it will keep me up at night uh, in a positive way. Um, Find ways to, to find activities that raise your energy level because it will keep you going, keep you contributing, and you'll, you'll have the best long shot at doing that. And challenge yourself a little bit. So I mentioned you have to get out of your comfort zone. So challenge yourself a certain amount, but make sure that you're not challenging yourself to the point you're burning yourself out doing things you hate all the time. Um, so find the, find the things that give you energy and, and use those to give yourself more energy. Um, and the final thing is never be afraid to ask if you can help. Uh, there's always plenty of work to do in the party, with candidates, um, with causes. Uh, if you if you have the time and and you're you're interested, there's always something to do. Nobody's going to be bothered that you ask them to help. Um, so if you want to change the world, if you want to be, the, and, and I said earlier, politics is a really small place. I see individual people all the time who pop up, and within a couple of years, they're a leader. Right? That's me. Like. I, my story is I went and I was pissed around the time, I think it was a couple weeks before Kasich drew, dropped out of the race in 2016. I was pissed about what was going on. I had my young daughter who had just been born in January. And I'm like, screw this. We got to do something better than this two-party system for my daughter. Um, so I just, I just decided I'm just going to start donating. And, and I found Libertarian Party. I'm like, I'm just going to take a step out on a limb. I'm just going to donate. And before you know it, here I am chair of the county party. <laughs> so it's, uh, there's a lot of opportunities by just saying yes, by just showing up, and by just saying what can I do to help, and being willing to do it, where you can move and have a lot of influence uh, more than you would have thought you could. And, and every politician you talk to, everybody who got into politics, they never started out as some big confident leader. Michelle started out saying, you know, I, she, she worked in the kitchen. And she said, she, she, you know, she, she worked for her kids and she never saw herself being a politician. Um, you're, the libertarian message, the most powerful thing about it is that we, self, we can determine ourselves. We have the, the responsibility and the power to change the world around us based on the, the uh, liberties we have to, to engage with the world. We have, you know, for better or worse, libertarians like to complain about lack of freedom. America is a pretty free country. You got a lot of opportunities around here. Um, so I would just say take advantage of that. Never be afraid to step up and always look for opportunities. Ask other people for how can I continue to grow and have an impact. So that's all I have. Uh, I am open for questions. Other than that, um, be awesome ninjas. Any questions?
questions? Geez, I did all the talking. I kind of wanted somebody else to. <laughs> Your presentation was pretty complete, so. I think you covered everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any other podcasts? Any other podcasts? Um, in terms of like practical libertarian podcasts, I would love to know of good ones. I know I know of good libertarian podcasts. Um, there are plenty of them out there. Um, most of them are kind of focused culturally libertarian, and I have absolutely no problem with that. Um, I know, for example, Johnny Adams just joined, joined our board. He runs the uh, Johnny Rocket Launchpad. Uh, awesome podcast, talks liberty stuff. Like, it's not as much like practical political stuff. Um, otherwise, I would. There's a lot of podcasts that are worth worth uh, listing here that are really good kind of, uh, I think there's like We Are Libertarians, there's, um, there's, there's plenty online of any good recommendations from the audience. There's a Freedom Report by um, Austin Peterson. Okay. Oh, Austin. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. I didn't know he had a podcast. Mm. He did it um, more regularly beforehand because he's running now. Yeah. He does it sporadically now, but if you go to a Republican. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Freedom Report. Well, you know, today Rand Paul is the only one in the in the Senate who's standing up against the big omnibus bill. He's so, it. <laughs> yeah, and he's and he's winning. Yeah, he's stalling it out, for what I hear. Mm -hmm. um, so I won't I won't um, judge anybody for their choice in where they're going to participate politically. I think there's a place for, you know, as much as I've chosen my place. I'm I'm a libertarian. I'm going to build the libertarian party. That's that's my role in taking on, and I'm not going to compromise that in terms of um, I'm not going to go endorse a Democrat or Republican. Uh, as a libertarian, uh, I understand that other people are working in different ways to help the liberty movement in general. I believe there are people who do that as Republicans and as Democrats, and I don't feel the need to tear them down individually for that personally. That's my position on on Austin. Um, I, I would obviously prefer if he invests in the libertarian brand. If he's got a cool plan, though, all the power to him. I just can't endorse him and won't endorse him as somebody who's building the libertarian brand. Um, at, as from my position as as a libertarian leader. Um, and can I ask, are you looking specifically for stuff that's strategy related, or you, would you be interested in uh, intellectual podcasts or like policy? Okay. All right. The libertarian ideas. I'm just saying what it was for Yeah, yeah. Johnny Rocket show is is pretty good. On, on that sort of stuff. He interviews a lot of people who are not even technically Libertarian Party, who are small L Libertarians, um, who are kind of, um, and he himself wasn't, he just rejoined the party. Uh, so, so he has, and he's based here, since he's based here in Washington, he has a fair amount of guests who are around local and stuff too. Um, well, if you are interested in podcasts that focus on Libertarian ideas, I, I'd recommend the Tom Woods Show. Um, and I think the value you get from that um, wouldn't necessarily be in terms of strategy, but it, I think it's good for us to be educated on you know what our ideals are and what the actual reasons for them are, why people should believe them. I think Tom Woods is really good for that. Tom Woods, okay. And yeah. I'm repeating because the camera might not pick up your voice, yeah, so for yeah. anybody listening. Yeah, Tom Woods um, and... Um, yeah, so he is someone I'd, I'd recommend. Um, so. Okay. Cool. How about as a uh, discreet ninja technique, infiltrating, getting elected at the federal level of one of the two main parties, and then decided, you know, it's a bold move. I bold I, move. I would not begrudge somebody who uh, who takes that strategy and succeeds with it. <laughs> <laughs> Might be what Austin Peterson is doing. Could be what he's doing. I, it's, <laughs> but it, it kind of my, my view on that goes a little bit to the political capital side of things. Like like it's it's risky because of of my point earlier. Politics is built on trust. Um, as you switch a party aff affiliation, there's trust burned in that course. You have to rebuild trust at a whole new place there to get momentum, to get donors, to get to take advantage of that R label. Um, you have to build trust. Well, sometimes if you're in the right place where there's enough, say, hatred for the Democrat there, you might not need a whole lot of trust. It's like, oh, yeah, he's the guy on the ballot who's going to beat a Democrat. Cool. Um, so you can have opportunities like that. Uh, other places, you know, if you're trying to flip a district that's 60% Democrat and you're trying to jump in as a new Republican who was a Libertarian, 
uh, that's going to be pretty hard, probably, because you're not going to get as much support from the Republicans because they're like, well, he's just a libertarian who just switched over, and he, you know. Um, and it goes doubly the other way. If you switch back to libertarian, now, <laughs> now all the people, you know, now you have divided camps within libertarians about the people who think you're just a double turncoat, people who think you're a strategic genius. Um, and so then, uh, you know, and it, so, uh, you know, it's, those are the trade-offs you face when you're, when you're making a decision like that. So it could potentially be interpreted as kind of a bait and switch, basically. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, we have example of Toby Nixon in our own county. He's nonpartisan right now. He's run, run and served Republican before. He's a paying Libertarian Party member and comes to our conventions. Um, is he a Republican? Is he a Libertarian? Is he an Independent? I, I don't feel the need. I, I, he can describe himself in that regards. I know he's, he's gone within all of those groups, and he's effective within all of those groups. Uh, and, and I applaud him for that, and I think he's a, a great example of how to be an effective leader while bridging all those gaps. Any more questions? I was getting to be. Oh, wow, have I? Been almost two hours. <clears throat> cool. Well, that's all I have. Let's just hang out for a while. All right.